Hello pattern readers. This video is going to be my second part of a refresher of season one of the wheel of time before you go into season two. I am going to recap what happened in each episode of season one, and I am going to avoid any book spoilers. So if you are either a show only watcher or you haven't advanced very far in the books, this will be a safe way for you to get up to speed going into the second season. In this video, I will cover the second half of season one episodes five through eight. So if you missed my part one recap video, you can click back to that one first. Remember how I told you the show might release its new episodes at midnight Pacific time this season, but there was some doubt? Well, Prime Video has updated and it now shows an earlier release time of midnight Greenwich Mean Time. I think this updated time is most likely to be correct, but just in case, you should still be prepared to refresh, refresh, refresh. In episode five, we open on Moraine, Lan, and their fellow Aes Sedai and Warders, burying the fallen from the attack by Loghain's followers, including Kareni Sedai. We skip ahead in time by one month, and we see the Aes Sedai party approaching the White Tower. Moraine and Lan reflect on how long it has been since they have been back. Rand and Matt approach Tarvalon from a different direction, and we can see how poorly Matt is doing because he snaps at a child who is also on the road. Rand thinks he recognizes the huge mountain in the distance near Tarvalon. Once they are in the city, they quickly head for an inn Tom had mentioned. Matt collapses on the bed, and Rand gives him a repeated assurance that it was the Fade who killed the Grinwell family, not Matt. In the White Tower, Moraine and Lan take Nynaeve to the Warder's Quarters, where they say Nynaeve will draw less attention as a channeler not yet enrolled in the novice book. Nynaeve doesn't trust that Moraine will tell her if she finds her friends. Moraine warns her about tower politics. After Lan leaves them alone, Moraine speaks openly to Nynaeve about how life-changing it is to channel for the first time. Egwene and Perrin approach Tarvalon with the Tuatha'an, but they run into a party of white cloaks and are recognized by Aemon Valda. Aram tries to help them escape, while the rest of the traveling people stand their ground as the white cloaks beat them. But Aram is run down, and Perrin and Egwene surrounded and apprehended. Rand meets an Ogier named Loyal. Ogier are non-human creatures known for their size and long lives. Loyal takes Rand for an Aeolman and is immediately interested in him. Rand rushes off to see Loghain being paraded through the streets. In case you blinked and missed it, here's Padan Fane in the crowd. As he and Matt watch, it looks like Loghain sees them and laughs wildly, but could it just be Matt's imagination? Matt makes Rand promise that if either of them can channel, they won't let the other end up like Loghain. The warders, Lan and Maxim and Ivan, help Stepan prepare for his last duty to Kareni. He recalls how she changed his life, and we learn that Alana has offered to bond Stepan, but he doesn't feel ready. We see Stepan deliver Kareni's ring into the fiery depths from whence it sprang. Whoops, wrong fantasy story. Moraine and Lan need no words to express their grief and fear with each other. The White Cloaks treat Egwene like an animal as they strip and clean her and dress her in white. Her hands are bound as Valda questions her and Perrin, who is also tied to a block. Valda firmly believes that Egwene can channel based solely on the evidence that he has run into her twice. He threatens to kill her, and she dares him to. He then turns to Perrin, torturing him in hopes of making her confess, claiming he would let Perrin live if she does. We see Perrin's eyes change a strange golden color as he is in pain. Valda then leaves them alone to discuss who should live and who should die. Stepan seeks out Nynaeve and asks for an herbal sleeping draft, which she gives him along with her compassion. She wanders out of her room and is quickly found by Leandrin, who hints at being treated poorly by men as a young girl discovering her power. Leandrin encourages Nynaeve to explore the library or the garden. It seems Nynaeve takes her advice because Loyal found her in the White Tower, and realizing she must be from the Two Rivers, brings her to Rand and Matt. Matt couldn't help snapping at Nynaeve when she tries to examine him, but she still advises Rand not to bring him to the White Tower, when Rand tells her he thinks Matt can channel. They are both worried about Egwene, but Nynaeve assures Rand she is alive and recalls that Egwene fought with everything she had to survive a deadly illness as a child. Egwene is unbreakable. Egwene is desperately trying to channel, and Perrin tries to stop her by confessing that he killed Layla accidentally and saying that he deserves to die. Egwene does not accept this and tells him it was not his fault and he will believe her one day, as Valda continues to torture him. Egwene finally embraces the One Power and channels just a spark to distract Valda, as she directs other flows to sever her own and Perrin's bonds. Valda is so terrified when he sees Perrin's golden eyes that Egwene is able to stab him, grab the Aes Sedai rings he took from the Aes Sedai he murdered, and she and Perrin run. Wolves have attacked the camp and jump on White Cloaks as Perrin and Egwene escape. 
Perrin says the wolves won't hurt them, but not how he knows this. Leandrin reveals an unexpected familiarity with Moraine as she taunts her about Nynaeve. Both admit the yellow Aja will recruit Nynaeve hard due to her healing ability, but Leandrin seems to think she could persuade her to the red. Moraine seems unconcerned. Stepan makes an offering to ward off the Forsaken, showing eight figurines, though mentioning only one is Shamael by name. Alana becomes highly curious when Moraine mentions hearing there could be a way to release a warder bond, but Moraine will not tell her anything about what she has been up to. Alana warns Moraine that they have been summoned by the Amerlin to answer for Loghain, and that Moraine has two powerful enemies in Leandrin and the Amerlin. Alana implicitly offers friendship, but Moraine keeps her secrets. Stepan makes Lan tea and seems to chat casually about the idea of bonding Alana and sharing a bed with her and Maxim and Yvonne. But he really wants to talk about Nynaeve and how he can see that she is falling in love with Lan. Lan will only say it's a bad idea for her. Lan wakes in the morning, realizing he had fallen asleep on the floor and was given sleeping herbs. He panics and runs to find Stepan, who has taken his own life. At Stepan's funeral, Lan is given the role of designated mourner to relieve the others of their grief. At first, he remains stoic, but as Moraine starts to feel his grief and he hers, he lets out a guttural, searing shout and the tears flow. In episode six, we meet a young girl with distinctive tattoos, Swan Sanche, and her father, who live and work near a large river delta in the country of Tyr. Her father warns her not to let anyone see her channel, and immediately we learn why. Channeling is so feared in Tyr that someone has burned their home and painted a dragon's fang, an accusation of evil. Swan and her father say a tearful goodbye as he sends her off to the White Tower in their tiny riverboat. Moraine, Alana, Leandrin, and their travel companions await the Amerlin in the hall of the tower, along with all remaining sitters from each Aja. The keeper of the chronicles, Liana, announces the Amerlin, and we see that it is an older Swan Sanche. Loghain is brought before her, and although he tries to anger her in hopes that she will order him killed, she does not take the bait, and calmly has him removed as he begs to be killed. Swan then turns her scrutiny on Moraine, Leandrin, and Alana. Leandrin is blamed for not bringing Loghain to trial before gentling him, though Alana and Moraine back her up. To deflect from her own punishment, Leandrin turns on Moraine, questioning why Moraine said nothing about how Nynaeve is the most powerful channeler in a thousand years. Moraine says she did not know, only suspected she could channel. When Leandrin turns to what Moraine has been up to for years, a blue sitter, Mygen, tries to cut her off. But this allows Leandrin to draw attention to the fact that Swan was once a blue sister. Swan takes up questioning Moraine herself, and Moraine gets down on her knees but refuses to answer. Swan finally unleashes fury and scorn at Moraine's noble blood and disobedience, but she defers judgment until the next day. Moraine and Lan go to the inn where Rand and Matt are staying. Rand tries to stand between them and Matt and shouts that he hasn't channeled, but Moraine quickly discovers what is really wrong with Matt as she stops him from stabbing her with the cursed dagger from Shadar Logath. She channels to pull some evil-looking stuff out of Matt and takes the dagger away from him. Rand thanks Moraine for risking herself to help Matt and tries to confirm that the dagger was the cause of Matt's sickness and not channeling. Moraine will not say for sure and says she healed him of his connection to the dagger, but warns Rand that Matt is still at risk if he touches it again. Nynaeve and Loyal arrive, and Moraine sets her down for hiding Matt from her and putting his life at risk. Moraine takes a meeting in a bath with Mygen, who clearly has an impressive network of eyes and ears, but still wants to know what Moraine has been up to outside of the tower. Mygen plans to intervene with Swan on Moraine's behalf, but expects her to remain in the tower as Mygen needs to go west to investigate missing ships. Moraine goes to a house of healing where yellow sisters are caring for Perrin. Egwene returns the Aes Sedai rings to Moraine and tells her she is worried about Perrin, telling her about his eyes and his interaction with the wolves. Moraine says to tell no one, but if she knows more, will not say. Lan confronts Moraine about masking their bond, and she tells him to watch over the Two Rivers folk, and he seems to relent and give his blessing to something unspoken. When alone, Moraine channels into the one piece of decoration in her room, and she is transported into a rustic hut, much like the one Swan grew up in. Swan herself is there, and we understand that, although angry, she and Moraine are only pretending to hate each other. This is a meeting of long-separated, secret lovers and two women with a shared purpose. Moraine tells Swan about her five potential dragons and lets free all of the doubts she has about what they really know about the dragon. 
They both know they would be stilled if anyone found out what they have been doing for 20 years. Maureen admits she would kill any of them before letting the Dark One have them, and then realizes Swan, too, has new information. Swan has had dreams about the Dark One, weakened at the Eye of the World. She wants Moraine to take all five to the Eye, to seize the advantage, but Moraine thinks the four who are not the dragon would die. Moraine tells Swan she must sentence her to exile, so Mygen can't force her to stay in the tower. The next day, Leandrin reveals she knows about friends of Nynaeve named Matt Cawthon and Rand, as well as the two with the Yellow Sisters. To shut her up, Moraine tells Leandrin she knows about a man she meets in North Harbor, and to back off or she will tell the Reds about him. Moraine and Lan meet with Loyal so she can ask for his help. Then she brings Egwene into the hall where she is reunited with Nynaeve. They both meet the Amerlin in the slightly less formal setting of her study, where Egwene seems shocked to learn that Nynaeve is a powerful channeler. Nynaeve has no interest in humoring Swan, even threatening to leave, but Swan tells them the last battle is coming and the wheel doesn't care what they want. They are called to something. Egwene asks what they need to do. Moraine says farewell to the tower before appearing in the hall to meet her sentence of exile. Moraine swears on the oath rod, bound by the one power, not to return to the tower. But in softer words for Swan's ears alone, she makes the oath to Swan personally and speaks to her the exact words of farewell Swan's father spoke to her years before. They both face their separation with tears, but without hesitation. The Aes Sedai turn their backs on Moraine as she leaves. Moraine is joined at a structure called a Waygate, first by Loyal and then by Lan and the Two Rivers folk. After their reunions, Nynaeve wants more answers, despite what they already know from the Amerlin. Moraine tells them they must go to the Dark One's prison at the Eye of the World to stop him while he is weak before he destroys the world. She will not say what will happen to those who are not the dragon. She channels to open the waygate, and they all begin to follow her into the darkness beyond, until they turn back and see that Matt alone has not followed, and the darkness closes between them. In Episode 7, a pregnant Aiel Maiden of the Spear runs through a snowy battlefield on a mountainside. She stunningly fights off multiple attackers while in active labor. As she is nearing delivery, one last soldier comes at her, pointing a sword we recognize with a heron-marked blade. In the ways, Nynaeve and Rand want to somehow go back for Matt. Moraine speaks of a darkness in Matt and moves on. Loyal explains the danger of channeling in the ways. Egwene says Matt left them, and Perrin has to convince Nynaeve to follow, who promises Rand they will return for Matt. Lan asks Moraine, what if Matt is the dragon? She doesn't believe it and says he would turn to the shadow now if he was. Perrin spots a defaced guiding stone long before anyone else can. The group rests while Loyal examines the stone. Egwene and then Rand wake just before a Trolloc jumps out, but a weave of the power pushes it off the edge. Loyal can tell that Machin Shin, the Black Wind, is coming, drawn by the channeling, which Egwene apologizes for. Moraine tells them not to listen to Machin Shin as they decide to head to a closer waygate at Faldara. In a flash, we see that Padan Fane has been following. The Black Wind screams to each of their greatest fears, and finally Nynaeve bursts out with a blast of the One Power to protect them as Moraine channels the Waygate open, and they escape. Everyone is shaken by what they just heard. Land seems to be recognized and greeted warmly everywhere in the fortress city of Faldara, but Moraine gets a very cool reception from Lord Agomar. She warns him about Trollocs in the Ways and advises closing up the Waygate, after which he softens and offers welcome to the group. Pot and Fane makes it out of the waygate before it can be blocked. Lady Amalisa, who is Lord Agomar's sister, is much friendlier to Moraine, and we learn that she can channel and trained in the White Tower, but was not strong enough to become an Aes Sedai. Moraine asks her to send a message to the Red Aja to find Matt Cawthon. Perrin thinks he spots Pot and Fane walking through the city, but Nynaeve doubts it. Moraine brings the group to see a bartender named Min. Min has an ability to see auras around people, which show things that will happen in their future. She sees Perrin with golden eyes, Rand holding a baby. Around Egwene and Nynaeve, she sees a white flame and a golden ring, but she doesn't say which is which. She sees that all four are linked by sparks of light. Around Moraine, she sees the Omerlin seat in full regalia, and she is going to be Moraine's downfall. Later, Moraine tells them that she went to Min in hopes that she could tell her which is the dragon, but she could not. She admits that she thinks anyone who goes to the Eye, who is not the dragon, will die there, but she tells them they must go anyway. Nynaeve insists they will make their own choices. The four of them argue. 
Egwene believes Moraine and wants to go, while Rand and Nynaeve don't trust Moraine. But when Perrin brings up Matt, the fight becomes personal. Rand turns on Egwene, Perrin defends her, and Nynaeve puts her foot in her mouth, suggesting that Perrin has feelings for Egwene. Rand believes this, and Perrin angrily tells him the only woman he's ever loved was his wife. Everyone storms off, and Nynaeve is racked with guilt. Moraine encourages Lan to find more in life than her, and tells him she likes Nynaeve. Lan goes to see a Malkiri family who greet him like a son. He spots Nynaeve watching and invites her in. They welcome her just as warmly. Later, when Lan says goodnight, Nynaeve isn't quite ready to part and follows him into his room, asking if he wants her to go. He doesn't and moves in to kiss her. Egwene confronts Rand. He says he knows there's nothing between her and Perrin, but she is angry that he accused her of not being a friend to Matt. He apologizes and they reconcile. He tells her to go to the White Tower, but she doesn't want to leave him. He says he will go and become her warder. She says she will stand by him no matter what, even if he is the dragon, and they kiss. Nynaeve dresses while Lan sleeps, but he wakes and tells her. He was once the future king of Malkir, a country taken by the Blight long ago, when he was a baby and his parents perished. Nynaeve understands that Lan found someone to belong to in Moraine, but he says Moraine doesn't own him, except in the way the kids own Nynaeve. He asks her to stay. Rand wakes next to Egwene and is flooded with memories. We see that his father Tam spoke to Rand about finding a baby, that Rand can channel the one power, and that Machin Shin told him he is the dragon reborn. Rand goes to see Min and wants her to tell him he isn't the dragon. She tells him about her very first vision when she was a child in Tarvalon. As she speaks, we cut back to the pregnant maiden of the spear, and the soldier who has found her is a young Tam Althor, who takes her hands as she delivers her baby. He holds baby Rand as his birth mother dies. In Min's first vision, she saw around Tam a baby being born on the slopes of Dragon Mount, and she knew what the baby would be. Min gives Rand a different answer than she gave Moraine about him. She does see the eye of the world, along with rainbows and carnivals and three beautiful women. In the morning, Egwene teases Nynaeve about not sleeping in her room, and Nynaeve apologizes for her blunder. Perrin joins them and then Lan, but Rand and Moraine do not appear because they have left for the Blight alone after Rand told her he is the one. Moraine masked the bond so that Lan would not follow. In episode 8, we see the last dragon lose Theron Telamon 3,000 years before, talking with his friend, the Tamerlan Seat, and trying to convince her to support his plan to cage the Dark One. They speak in the old tongue. She says it is too risky and the women Aes Sedai will not follow him. He is not shaken from his purpose. We see they live in an advanced technological society. Rand and Moraine make their way through the Blight towards the Eye of the World, and she warns him of its dangers. They rest near the ruined Seven Towers of Malkir. Egwene is distraught that she cannot follow Rand. Perrin tries to comfort her. She tells him she loves Rand, and he says he does too, reaffirms their friendship, and supports her. Lan tells Nynaeve, Moraine doesn't want to be followed, but Nynaeve encourages him by telling him how she tracked Moraine before. Lan is surprised she is willing to be left behind, but Nynaeve asks him to bring Rand back. She tells him she may not always be a wisdom and could be with him. He gently and admiringly tells her she should choose someone else. Rand has a dream in which the Dark One kills Moraine and then removes his glowing eyed mask to reveal a normal looking man. The man seems to recognize Rand as the man he had been in his last life, Luz Theron Telamon. The man mocks him for his lack of a plan and his innocence. Rand stabs himself to end the dream. He demands Moraine tell him a plan, and she reveals a Sangreal he can use to increase the power of his channeling a hundredfold. Moraine says she cannot teach Rand to channel, but that he will do so instinctively when his life is in danger. She recalls an older Aes Sedai who got Moraine through her difficulty channeling as a novice by beating her with the one power, until Moraine instinctively channeled to stop her. Nynaeve tries to listen to the wind, but cannot do it. Egwene hears something wrong. Egwene, Perrin, and Nynaeve try to get answers from Min, but she says people's secrets are their own. She sees a vision of Nynaeve nearly burning out and several soldiers dying, and then a horn calls, signaling a massive host of Shadowspawn heading towards Faldara. Lord Agomar prepares to defend at Tarwin's Gap, even though Amalisa doesn't believe it can hold against 10,000 Trollocs. Agomar is warned there are dark friends inside the walls. Agomar tells his sister he believes they are facing the last battle. And she is right, but they must hold as long as they can and warn the rest of the world. 
she vows not to let the city fall. Rand tells Moraine not to follow him into the eye if she will die there, but she will not leave him. He recognizes the eye, but Moraine cannot tell him more because Dark Friends purged all records about it. Rand can see an image of himself as Luz Theron Telamon, as well as the Dark One, looking like a man. As he touches the symbol at the eye, he is seemingly transported to the Two Rivers, a home of his own, with Egwene as his wife and their infant daughter. At the eye, Moraine holds Rand as he is unconscious. The man appears and cuts her off from the One Power. He shows a multi-finger ring that looks just like the one Luz Theron Telamon had. Agomar leads forces to defend Tarwin's Gap, while Amalisa leads Shinaran women to prepare the city and calls for the aid of any women who can channel. Min leaves Faldara behind. Agomar's men, Yakota and Uno, follow his orders and begin tearing up the floor under his throne. Perrin is frustrated at not knowing what to do, at not fighting. Loyal tells him to ask how he can help, and they find Uno and help the Shinarans dig as Agomar instructed. Uno tells Perrin they are digging up the Horn of Valir for the dragon to call the pattern's greatest heroes at the last battle. Loyal tells Nynaeve and Egwene about the call for women channelers. Nynaeve says she can't lose anyone else, but Egwene is determined. They join Amalisa and two other women on the empty field between Faldara and Tarwin's Gap. Agomar at the Gap takes a spear to the chest as the shadow spawn break through. Amalisa forms a circle, drawing the one power through all five women, but controlling the flows herself. Amalisa unleashes a massive amount of the power at the shadow spawn, demolishing them before they can reach the city. But the amount of the power is too much, and the women start burning out and dying one by one. Amalisa cannot let go of the power, even after defeating the Trollocs. Nynaeve sees that Egwene is about to burn out and pulls more of the power back to herself. Amalisa dies, burned out by channeling too much, and the flows stop, but Nynaeve is badly singed. Egwene is afraid Nynaeve will die, but channels to heal her. Padan Fane murders his way into the keep with two fades. Perrin spots Fane and leaves the others to their digging. Perrin comes back to find Fane stabbing Loyal and most of the men dead. Fane has a dagger that looks just like the one Matt had. Fane grabs the box containing the Horn of Valir and tells Perrin that he came to the two rivers because of Rand, Perrin, Egwene, Nynaeve, and Matt. Rand may be the dragon, but all five are Tavirin, focal points for the pattern with a part to play. Fane believes some or all will turn to the shadow, and we get a quick shot of Matt back in Tarvalon. Perrin picks up an axe, but he cannot swing it. Fane leaves, trailed by the fades, carrying the Horn of Valir. Rand starts to suspect his vision of Egwene is not real, but as soon as she convinces him, the image freezes and the man appears, telling him he can show Rand how to make it real. By threatening the vision of Egwene, the man gets Rand to ask him how. He guides Rand to channel. Moraine holds a knife to Rand's throat and says she will kill him if he joins the Dark One instead of fighting him. Rand channels more, and Moraine can see that the Sa'angriol is being used. Rand tells the man that he might want the life he is offering him, but Egwene doesn't. And an Egwene who doesn't care about being an Aes Sedai is not the woman he loves. He turns his channeling on the man and his own body wakes. Rand releases the power at him, but the man smiles as he disappears, and the symbol beneath their feet cracks. Rand tells Moraine he won't go back to the others, because he felt the madness from channeling and fears hurting those he loves. He asks her to tell the others he died there, and even though she reminds him she cannot lie, she agrees to let them think it. He walks away, not telling her where he will go. Lan finds Moraine, and she tells him Rand is gone, and she cannot unmask the bond because she cannot touch the source. She holds a piece of Quandiar from the cracked stone. It is supposed to be unbreakable, even by the one power, and she knows this was only the first of many battles. On the far western shore, a strange fleet of ships carrying women channelers wearing collars and gags create a massive wave to clear their approach. Thank you for watching and sharing this recap of season one of the Wheel of Time. I hope you will subscribe and follow for Wheel of Time season two content. And now more than ever, gird your loins, my friends.